Welcome back, dear friends, to another exciting episode of the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah. We are on part 21, part 2, covering paragraphs 91 through 95. And without any further ado, dear friends, we'll have our opening prayer. Thank you so much. O oh Lord, my God, assist thy loved ones to be firm in thy faith, to walk in thy ways, to be steadfast in thy cause. Give them thy grace to withstand the onslaught of self and passion, to follow the light of divine guidance. Thou art the powerful, the gracious, the self-subsisting, the bestower, the compassionate, the almighty, the all-bountiful. Beautiful, Miss Darla. Thank you, as always. Okay, my dear friends, welcome back. Welcome back. So let us get back into our study. So we're studying, <clears throat> first of all, if this is your first time joining us, welcome, welcome, welcome. So we're studying the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. And the dispensation of Baha'u'llah is the sixth letter in the world order of Baha'u'llah selected letters, okay? It was written February 8th, 1934. And we are currently in the section entitled The Administrative Order. <clears throat> We're covering paragraphs 91 through 95. And paragraph 91 starts at the very beginning of the section, The Administrative Order. And it's found in my uh, World Order of Baha'u'llah on page 143. And it goes all the way to the end, page 144 at the bottom. Okay, so that's this is what we're covering. Uh, part the, to complete part 21 tonight. Okay, paragraphs 91 through 95. Okay, so now let me share my screen so we're all on board on this. Here we go. So. You can always go back to the session from last time and catch up on this part. But uh, because I asked the, this question to the class before the recording started, I want to show this slide. And I'm very proud of Ms. Yuda for remembering this. Um, this, is, this is what the, uh, I asked. I asked, what is... Abdul Baha's greatest legacy to posterity, the brightest emanation of his mind, the brightest emanation of his mind. And it is the will and testament of Abdul Baha, the will and testament of Abdul Baha. This is from the beloved guardian in God Passes By. The beloved guardian says, the charter which called into being, outlined the features and set in motion the processes of this administrative order is none other than the will and testament of Abdul Baha. His greatest legacy to posterity, the brightest emanation of his mind. The brightest emanation of his mind. So if ever Esan again asked the class, what was the brightest emanation of the mind of Abdul Baha? His greatest legacy. All in unison would say, the will and testament of Abdul Baha. And why is it the will and testament of Abdul Baha? because it laid the foundation for the administrative order. You see that, how important that is? So this is, uh, it lay, it play, not only laid the foundation, but set in motion the processes for this administrative order. So how important is that, right? So we carry on, dear friends, regarding its implications. So why are we talking about the admin, this uh, will and testament of Abdu'l-Bahá? Because in paragraphs 93, 94, and 95, the beloved guardian directly addresses the will and testament of Abdu'l-Bahá and lays its importance down in relation to the administrative order. So that's why... In these um, slides, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the will and testament of Abdul Baha. So uh, its importance, its implications in relation to the administrative order. 
So regarding its implications and importance, the beloved guardian points out, this is such an incredible quote. What does the guardian say here? He says, the contents of the will of the master is far too much for the present generation to comprehend. It needs at least a century of actual working before the treasuries of wisdom hidden in it can be revealed. 100 years. And what does he say? At least a century, right? Am I, am I quoting correctly? At least a century. Okay, so 1921, we just had a 100th anniversary of the passing of Abdul Baha, now to 2021. And that's just at least a century. Just for what? For the present generation to comprehend the significance, the implications, and importance of this chartered document of the administrative order. This is such an incredible thing. The beloved guardian says, you know, to all the friends that were, you know, prior to that, at least a hundred year point, he says, you're too close. You're too close to this, you know, the, 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 this period that you have to have at least a hundred years to, to see. And in this 100 years, now you see how the institutions have come into being, right? the national spiritual assemblies, the local spiritual assemblies, the regional Baha'i councils, and all of these institutions have come into being. And in this incredible period, in this at least 100 years, and this is all because of this will and testament of Abdul Baha, which has created the processes for the, the for the, for this movement, really. That's why I, I love the words of um, the beloved guardian when he says this is a movement, the Baha'i movement because it's really, this is what it is it's recreating the spiritual vibrancy of the whole world and this is, um, this is what it is this is the um, in this age so at least a hundred years, right? to understand this will and testament there are three important provisions of the will this is such a beautiful summary of the will and testament of Abdul Baha. So um, this is found in Hassan Baliuzi's masterpiece, Abdul Baha. Okay. So this is very nice little summaries, points of what is in the will and testament of Abdul Baha. Okay. There are three important provisions of the will through which Abdul Baha has created an infallible protection for the cause. Okay, so infallible. What does infallible mean? Anyone in my class, infallible? Unquestionable. Unquestionable. Um, no doubt. Free from error is, it would be infallible. Free, cannot, fallible means to make an error or make a mistake. Infallible means you're free from it. You, can, you're, you cannot it's make an error or make a mistake. Final. Uh, so, Abdul Baha is created an infallible protection for the cause. Okay, these are the three points that the explicit appointment of the beloved guardian Shorifan, his grandson as his successor and guardian of the Baha'i faith. So, this is the first infallible protection of the cause: the appointment of the beloved guardian. So is Second. the House of Justice is infallible? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Universal House of Justice is absolutely infallible. Yes, dear Tesfai. And we're going to come to that uh, in, in an upcoming part on these twin institutions, the guardianship and the Universal House of Justice. Okay? The, the Universal House of Justice is absolutely infallible. Yes. Okay, coming up. Defending his successor from any possible challenge and providing guidance and the means for establishing the universal house of justice. This in itself provides a clear structure for the implementation of the Baha'i administration to support the establishment and functioning of the universal house of justice. The universal house of justice 
is under the protection of Abdul Baha. That is also in the will and testament of Abdul Baha. It is infallibly protected as an institution. It is also written in the Kitab Ahdas. His Holiness Baha'u'llah, in his own pen, wrote that the, the men of Baha is it's as that is an institution that is also protected. So aspect of universal protection, infallibility, absolutely, uh, dear Tesfai. That is very categorical and clear. Okay. So these are the, I mentioned the, the important provisions, the appointment of the beloved guardian, defending his successor from any possible challenge, namely the beloved guardian, as well as providing guidance namely for the Universal House of Justice and the implementation of the provisions of the Baha'i administration. So these are these three main uh, provisions for the will and testament of the Baha'i. In paragraph 95, this is a, the longer paragraph at uh, the bottom of page 144. In paragraph 95, the beloved guardian highlights that the Baha'i administrative order can be considered as the framework of the will and testament of Abdul Baha. The inviolable stronghold wherein this newborn child is being nurtured and developed. The potentialities and full implications of the will will be manifested as the administrative order expands and consolidates itself. I love this analogy of the child is being nurtured in the stronghold. And if you look at the history of our faith, how these institutions have started, and they have started as, you know, in the very nascent form, very... Um, per se, childlike forms, un but through great sacrifices of heroes and heroines, opening areas, teaching and bringing in hearts and souls and, and um, forming of assemblies. And then eventually these assemblies, um, these institutions have been coming together. And these through these institutions, they were still in very nascent forms, even on the consultation. And if you think, you know, you're serving on an institution, wherever you are, right? It's still very nascent. Remember, you might be living in a city of, say, 10,000 people, 100,000 people. How many Baha'is are actually in your city? It's not 100,000 people, I assure you, in that city. It's still maybe 20 people, 30 people, or 50 people. When the numbers get much greater, you will start seeing how the population starts influencing the consultation of the actual institution. And the institution's consultation starts to mature and has actually, the institution will start having an effect on the greater society. It's because remember the institution's role is not just for the Baha'is. The, 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 is the local spiritual assembly is not just serving the Baha'is. The National Spiritual Assembly is not just serving the Baha'i community of the United States. It's serving the, the community of the United States. You see what I'm saying? So as the numbers increase, you will see how there will be uh, this correlation of the of how the dialogue and the, uh, will be entering into the greater society. And this is what, what will be happening right now. Also, the maturation of the institution will go hand in hand with that um, as the numbers of the community increase because the pressures will also be on the institution. You know, think about it, you know, as, you know, in a small community of, say, 30 people in or 50 people. There's only so many things that a community can consult on, you know, and, you know, there's holy days, there's, you know, there's feasts, and there's events and local activities. But as the numbers in a community also rises, the challenges, 
the problems, the events, the coordinations, all of these also rise. But also those pressures also, you know, go to the institution. And so the institution also will have to face those challenges as well as commensurately that will mature along with the challenges. And so this is uh, one of the beautiful things that goes hand in hand with teaching. As the teaching work goes on and the friends enter into the faith, the institution will have to take on those challenges as well as the, the, the work of the institution will get greater, but also it will be like um, um, nutrients for the soil of the growth of this new plant, this emerging institution, um, these uh, new um, followers the, the, of the faith. And so this is will be enriching the institution of um, all right, continuing on this vein of this, the will and testament of Abdul Baha. The beloved guardian refers to the will and testament of Abdul Baha as this supreme, this infallible organ for the accomplishment of a divine purpose and the charter of Baha'u'llah's new world order. Since this document, together with the Kitab Ahdas, contains the essential elements of the civilization to be established through the world order of Baha'u'llah. So these two documents are absolutely pivotal, pivotal to the establishment of the world order of Baha'u'llah, namely the Kitab Ahdas, the most holy book, as well as the will and testament of Abdul Baha, this supreme, this infallible organ for the accomplishment of a divine purpose. It's the foundation and the prime purpose and um, for the implementation of the Baha'i administrative order. So it's really the, the will and testament of Abdul Baha. So if you haven't read the will and testament of Abdul Baha recently, go back to it. You know, that, how we see how important this document is, right? So go back to it and see and just, you know, see what is so significant about this. Go back, you know, because this, the beloved guardian is here, is just putting so much weight and importance on this. So I want you to understand and how weighty a document is the will and testament of Abdul Baha. Again, here we go. The Will and Testament of Abdul Baha and the Kitab Ahdas, and here I got the cover, covers of both of these, right? Are not only complementary. This is such an important quote, and this is coming straight out of World Order Baha'u'llah. This is a page four. So if anyone says, Esam, what's on? This is the very one, first one that's literally called the World Order of Baha'u'llah, okay? It's, it's the first letter. So this is a quote from the very first letter. We're on the sixth letter, okay? So, of the world order of Baha'u'llah. This one, this quote is coming from, this one is coming from the first letter. This is what it says. The beloved guardian says, oh, sorry. It says, they are not only complementary, name, namely the will and testament of Abdul Baha and the Kitab Ahnas. They're not only complementary, but that they mutually confirm one another and are inseparable parts of one complete unit. And on the relationship between these two documents, the beloved guardian further makes the following statement. A study of the provisions of these sacred documents will reveal the close relationship that exists between them, as well as the identity of purpose and method which they inculcate. Far from regarding their specific provisions as incompatible and contradictory in spirit, every fair-minded inquirer will readily admit that they are not only complementary, but that they mutually confirm one another and are, this is very important, inseparable parts of one complete unit. Not only complementary, 
but they confirm one another and are inseparable. You cannot just, you cannot take one without the other. You can't just say, oh, I believe in the Kitab Ahdas, but this will and testament, I'm not sure about, you know, all of these provisions or whatever. Inseparable as a Baha'i. Cannot take one without the other. They're complementary and inseparable. And, they're, and they mutually confirm one another. Go so hand in hand. All right. We're going to the next quote. Let's us have a reader. My dear Farzad John, if you could kindly read this one. Sure. Shoghi Effendi continues a comparison of their contents with the rest of Baha'i sacred writings will similarly establish the conformity of whatever they contain with the spirit as well as the letter of the <laughs> authenticated writing writings and sayings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. In fact, he who reads the Aghdas with care and diligence will not find it hard to discover that the most holy book itself anticipates in a number of passages, the institutions which Abdul Baha ordains in his will. By leaving certain matters unspecified and unregulated in his book of laws, Baha'u'llah seems to have deliberately left a gap in the general scheme of the Baha'i dispensation, which then equivocal. equivocal provisions of the master's will have failed. To attempt to attempt to divorce the one from the other, to insinuate that the teachings of Baha'u'llah have not been upheld in their entirely, entirety and with absolute integrity by what Abdul Baha has revealed in his will is an in unpardonable affront to the unswerving fidelity that has characterized the life and labors of our beloved master. Beautifully read. Thank you, Farzajan. Beautiful, beautiful. So here, the beloved guardian, this is again coming from that first letter, the world order of Baha'u'llah. The beloved guardian is now addressing the Kitab Ahdas, the most holy book of Baha'u'llah. And he's saying, anyone that is a fair and equitable reading, fair and equitable in their study of the Kitab Ahdas, they will notice, they will notice in their study, discover that the most holy book, right, anticipates in a number of passages, the institutions which Abdul Baha ordains in his will. So it's very clear. If you are equitable, you're fair in your judgment, and you study it with care and diligence, you will notice. He says it will not be hard to discover. It won't be hard. His Holiness Baha'u'llah mentions the men at the House of Justice in his in the Kitab Ahdas, it's right there. He mentions local spiritual assemblies in the Kitab Ahdas. He mentions these things. So it says it will not be hard. You will not find it hard to discover that the Most Holy Book itself anticipates a number of passages regarding the institutions which Abdul Baha ordains in his will. But His Holiness Baha'u'llah leaves certain matters unspecified and unregulated in his Book of Laws. So he leaves some things open, right? Unspecified and unregulated in his Book of Laws. The beloved guardian states, 
it seems to have deliberately left a gap in the general scheme of the Baha'i dispensation, which the unequivocal provisions of the master's will have filled. Remember what the word the beloved guardian used previously? What did he use? That beautiful word, the complementary, right? When I hear complementary, I think of a jigsaw piece. There's that hole, that kind of like curvature, like a jigsaw, and the other one just fits perfectly into it. The Kitab Akhdas has these, per se, ma certain matters unspecified and unregulated in his book of laws. And it has been deliberately left a gap in, this, in the scheme of Baha'i dispensation. But what happens? His successor, His Holiness Ab Baha, divinely in his, um, in his will, in the unequivocal provisions of his will, they have filled, they have, his, the master's will have filled those matters that were the, His Holiness Baha'u'llah had left unspecified and unregulated. Now, the last lines here is exactly what the beloved guardian had wrote before, that you cannot, you cannot separate the Kitab Ahdas and the Will and Testament of Abdu'l-Bah. You just can't. They're complementary. They are mutually confirm one another. They are inseparable. Okay? The beloved guardian, again, hits it home. Boom! He hits it home very clearly and categorically in this last line. What does he say? To attempt. Oh, my. He says, to attempt. He says, to attempt. To attempt. To divorce. Divorce the one from the other. Means to separate them. You know, I'm, I'm, this is America. We know what divorce is in this country, right? So the divorce, to divorce the one from the other, to insinuate. Insinuate means to suggest. To suggest that the teachings of Baha'u'llah have not been upheld in their entirety and with absolute integrity by what Abdul Baha has revealed in his will is what? So even if you suggest it, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, Abdul Baha's will and testament is this or that, or even to suggest it. What does the beloved guardian say? Even to suggest it, what does he say? This is, this is so important. He says, this is an unpardonable affront. An affront is what? An attack. This is an unpardonable, it cannot be forgiven. Unpardonable affront to the unswerving fidelity. What does fidelity mean? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Unswerving. He stayed on the, the straight and narrow. Did not go off. Unswerving fidelity that has characterized the life and labors of our beloved master. His Holiness Abdul Baha. So this, if you even suggest, even to an inkling, that His Holiness Abdul Baha, His Holiness Abdul Baha, anything in His will and testament wasn't complementary to the Kitab Ahdas, or it's, you know, that would be an attack, an affront to the unswerving fidelity of His Holiness Abdul Baha. You would, you would be saying directly that Abdul Baha was per se doing his own thing. That's what you would be saying. Abdul Baha was not being faithful to the covenant. And remember who Abdul Baha is, the center of the covenant. So it, it would be a direct attack. Okay. Oh, everything that we're covering, dear friends, everything that we're covering in the entire dispensation of Baha'u'llah, this text, are the fundamental beliefs of what it means to be a Baha'i. So I just want you to remember these uh, as we're studying them. The beloved guardian statements assert that the origin of the Baha'i administrative order is based on the core of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. 
and is one of its intrinsic components. The beloved guardian, Shoei Effendi, emphatically states that the Baha'i administration is not an innovation imposed arbitrarily upon the Baha'is of the world since the master's passing, but derives its authority from the will and testament of Abdu'l-Bah is specifically prescribed in unnumbered tablets and rests in some of its essential features upon the explicit provisions of the Kitab Ahtas. This is another awesome statement coming from the beloved guardian in that uh, uh, incredible letter, the World Order of Baha'u'llah. The first, of, this is the first one in the world uh, of the six, of the seven letters. It's called the World Order of Baha'u'llah. That this administrative order, as a Baha'i administrative order, did not come into creation. It's not an innovation. That is just happened to start by the passing of Abdu'l Baha, 1921. It didn't start there. This administrative order, but here the beloved guardians say. It derived its authority from the will and testament of Abdul Baha and is spe specifically prescribed in unnumbered tablets. And, and some of them are, you know, the Lohidonya, Taraza, Tishraqat, you know, the ones, the tablets of Baha'u'llah revealed after Kitab Ahtas. And, se and several of them where he, uh, His Holiness Baha'u'llah mentions the Universal House of Justice. Talking so these are on many of them and talking um, and that's why it says specifically prescribed in unnumbered tablets and rests in some of its essential features upon the explicit provisions of the Kitab Ahtas. So that was a very interesting quote. I wanted because uh, we're talking about um, the importance of the will and testament of Abdul Baha, but this administrative order did not start. Then the Baha'i administrative order did not start from the passing of Abdul Baha. This, that's where that, this quote came from. And this is also not a lovely quote from Janet Khan. Janet Khan, wonderful, um, incredible um, uh, lady. Um, they call them um, the leaves, the leaves um, in, in the faith. Uh, they, these, um, and so she's an incredible lady. And what she said is, the beloved Gardi Sholifani used to compare the stages in the administrative order of the faith to this monument, saying the platform of three steps was like the local assemblies, right? The platform, this is the local assemblies right here, right? The pillars, these, the columns, right? The pillars like the national assemblies and the dome right here that crowned them and held them together like the universal house of justice, which could not be placed in position until the foundations and pillars were first firmly erected. So this was a process. That's why it took all the way till 1963 that we had to have sufficient number of local assemblies, sufficient number of national spiritual assemblies till the, and this was after the 10 year plan, the 10 year crusade, right? That eventually at that point in time, the, the world was ready for the universal house of justice. This would, these pillars, these columns had been erected and it was time at that point for the, this incredible dome structure to be placed on top of this monument. I'm, being, I'm talking symbolically here, um, that this now this um, administrative order this of this uh, could be have now its crowning institution, namely the Universal House of Justice. So this is um, this lovely um, description of these, how these um, institutions are, um, interconnected in that sense. The local spiritual assembly, national spiritual assembly, universal house of justice. Okay, carrying on. In the world order of Baha'u'llah, the beloved guardian highlights the major references to the Baha'i administration made by Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha in their writings. In the tablets of Baha'u'llah, 
the institutions of the Universal House of Justice and the local House of Justice are clearly established. Okay, so this is mentioned in the tablets of, of Baha'u'llah. It's mentioned in Kitab Ahtas, it's mentioned in several other tablets, the, the local houses of justice, as well as the, how, the men of the, of the house of justice, namely the universal house of justice. So this is, these are two institutions are very clearly mentioned in tablets of Baha'u'llah. The institution of the hands of the cause of God. It's another institution that sadly we don't have around anymore. So this uh, institution of the hands of the cause was established by the appointment of four members by His Holiness Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha later named four other people posthumously as members of this institution. So this was another institution that this is all this, this is part of the administrative order. So this was another institution that His Holiness Baha'u'llah brought into being, the institution of the hands of the cause of God. Okay. The institutions of the local spiritual assemblies and national spiritual assemblies were functioning at an embryonic stage before the passing of Abdul Baha. So local spiritual assemblies were brought in by um, His Holiness uh, Baha'u'llah in, and national spiritual assemblies were really not in, they were not, they were in the nascent, nascent, nascent stage. Okay, in, and uh, at the time of the passing of Abdul Baha, but it was really the will and testament of Abdul Baha that really helped uh, bring into existence this institution, the National Spiritual Assembly. The nature and operation of the administrative order was formally proclaimed and established by Abdul Baha in his will and testament. So the nature and operation of this administrative order was formally proclaimed and established by Abdul Baha in his will and testament. So I just wanted you to, we're going to um, have talk more in, in upcoming part on the hands of the cause of God, this institution. And I encourage you um, to watch the videos of the hands of the cause of God on YouTube. It's uh, there's this is an institution that um such, such, such incredible souls. Um, these names that some of you may recognize and some you may not recognize. But I encourage you uh, in your spare time to read as much as you can about them, as well as um, you can, there's these wonderful Baha'i videos on YouTube on the hands of the cause of God, and you can watch them. And I encourage you to learn as much as you can. And also, many of these hands of, of the cause of the God have there have there's books written about them. So I encourage you to also to read as much as you can. So I'm just uh, have uh, some of these upcoming slides talking about who these hands of the cause of God. The first one is these are the four hands of the cause of God that were appointed by His Holiness Baha'u'llah. Okay, um, Haji Ahud. This is his full name: Mullah Ali Akbar Shah Mirzadi. So Haji Ahund, this is his date of birth, 1842, roughly to 1843. They didn't, they didn't have good trend, uh, record keeping back in those days. Um, so it was roughly this period, okay? And this is uh, when he passed, to roughly to March 4th, 1910. So that was Haji Ahund. And then there was Ibn Abhar. He was also a hand of the cause of God. I encourage you to read these the lives of these stories, these great souls, truly such blessed uh, individuals. Okay, and another one was Adib, Adib Ulama, and you can see the details on this. And the last one was Ibn Azdak. Okay, and you can see the details. Um, so these were the four hands of the cause of God appointed by Baha'u'llah. The first. Uh, uh, per se contingent. Um, then there were outstanding believers referred to posthumously as hands of the cause of God by Abdul Baha. Okay, this these were mentioned in his incredible work, Memorials of the Faithful, 
which I encourage you again, another great book to read. I actually um, made a video uh, uh, covering every one of these souls. And I wrote to the Universal House of Justice to get all the pictures of those souls that are in the memorials of the faithful that we may have not seen. And so I included many of those pictures in the video that you may have not seen before. So that's another incredible, and that's you can find that on the Crimson Academy um, um, playlist on, on YouTube. If you look for it, it's Memorials of the Faithful. So this is the outstanding believers that passed away. Um, and His Holiness Abdu'l-Baha has referred to them as hands of the cause of God. Okay? Nabila Akbar. This is Agha Muhammad Qayani. So Nabil Akbar, and he was, uh, he's actually, I think, the first one in Memorials of the Faithful. Nabil Akbar. Okay. Uh, Mirza Ali Muhammad. Mirza Ali Muhammad. So he was also um, one of the posthumously um, mentioned as Hand of the Cause of God. Sheikh Muhammad Reza Yazdi. And this is no clear evidence has so far been found to resolve the identity of the man by this name mentioned by Abdul Baha. Some of these, there's more information than others, okay? And then the last one is Ismala Azdak. This is a sudden, got to read, the, uh, you got to read uh, Memorials of the Faithful because these souls are absolute gems. So Ismala Azdak, what an incredible, when I, because uh, I remember reading, because um, I read the whole uh, Memorials of the Faithful. So when I he hear these names, the accounts come fresh to my head and I, I'm, I get so excited. These, what is Ismala Azdak, what an incredible individual. So I encourage you to read Memorials of the Faithful too. So that, those were the different contingents. First one was, appointed by Baha'u'llah, and the second one was men uh, mentioned posthumously by uh, Abdul Baha in Memorials of the Faithful. So in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, the beloved guardian highlights the major references to the Baha'i administration made by Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha in their writings. In the Kitab Akhdas, the institution of the guardianship was anticipated. So the guardianship was anticipated, right, in the Kitab Akhdas. In paragraph 42 of the Kitab Akhdas, Baha'u'llah states, Endowments dedicated to charity referred to God, the revealer of signs. None hath the right to dispose of them without leave from him who is the dawning place of revelation. After him, this authority shall pass to the Akhsan, and after them to the house of justice, should it be established in the world by them that they may use these endowments for the benefit of the places which have been exalted in this cause and for whatsoever hath been enjoined upon them by him who is the God of might and power. Otherwise, the endowments shall revert to the people of Baha who speak not except by his leave and judge, not save in accordance with what God hath decreed in this tablet. Lo, they are the champions of victory betwixt heaven and earth, that they may use them in the manner that have been laid down in the book by God, the mighty, the bountiful. So first they shall pass to who? The Akhsan. Remember, the beloved guardian is a, and a member of the, uh, the family of Akhsan, right? He is coming from the twin surging seas. He's coming from the family of the blessed Bob, the Afnan. He's coming from the family of Baha'u'llah, the Akhsan. So he is a member of the Akhsan. And so he is uh, that priceless pearl coming from the twin surging seas. So, and then after him, it would go to the universal house of justice. Paragraph 42. 
And in this statement cited from the Kitab Ahtas, Baha'u'llah envisages the termination of the line of Ahsan, his male descendants. This is, and ordains that endowments shall pass to the people of Baha. And this is according to the notes section of the Kitab Ahtas, the term people of Baha is used with a number of different meanings in the Baha'i writings. In this instance, they are described as those who speak not except by his leave and judge not save in accordance with what God hath decreed in his tablet. And following the sudden passing of the beloved guardian in 1957, the hands of the cause of God directed the affairs of the community until 1963, when the Universal House of Justice was elected for the first time. So in this instance, it could be interesting because there's men of Baha, right? And then there's people of Baha, which is an interesting, you know, subject, you know, for its discussion. And the people of Baha, you know, it's, it, was, it, it was his male descendants and ordains that endowments shall pass to the people of Baha. And according to the notes section, the people of Baha has a number of different meanings. Those who speak not except by his leave and judge not save in accordance with what God hath decreed in this tablet. So the people of Baha could be nay, the hands of the cause of God in this context. The people of Baha. And here we see this is the hands of the cause of God and members of the first Universal House of Justice elected in 1963. These individuals, I mean, this is the first time in the history of religion that individuals that religiously had um, a, an appointed religious position, right? At a re appointed religious position as hand of the cause of God. But when it was time for election for the Supreme Body, they removed their names from that appoint, uh, from that election. It is an incredible thing that uh, the aspect, that's why it says, those who speak not except by his leave, and judge not save in accordance with what God hath decreed in him. You do not speak except what is in the text. You do not say anything else except what is revealed are the hands of the cause of God. So you know, one thing that she, uh, so Please, to go ahead. Go ahead, dear Tesla. Yeah, one thing which I want to add to the house of the hand of the cause is if they are not present at that time and bring the faith up to this level, today I don't think that we have the Universal House of Justice to be elected and then to be, you know, established like, because they are the foundations and then the link between the guardianship and the Universal House of Justice in between to take care of the faith and stand firm and going straight forward. And that's their mission. That's why their name is to be removed from there and goes to the Universal House of Justice, taking the administrative order. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. I'm in agreement. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's why we don't have them now. Yes. Right now, we have a lot of administration orders take care of all those jobs and then the pioneers and everything, they take care of it. So everything goes under the Universal House of Justice. Absolutely, absolutely. So here's a very uh, nice slide that I came across. Okay, you can see on the left. Okay, it says Sayyid Ali Muhammad the Shirazi. This is the Blessed Bob. This is his ministry, 1844 to 1853, nine-year period. Then His Holiness Baha'u'llah, 
This is his given name, Mirza Hossein Ali Nuri. This is his lifespan, and his ministry was 39 years. And then His Holiness Abdul Baha was a 29 year ministry, 1892 to 1921. Then the beloved guardian, 1921 to 1957, 36 year ministry. Then the hands of cause of God, the chief stewards, right? The chief stewards of Baha'u'llah's embryonic world order was from 1957 to 1963, six year period. So they had, they held the reins of the faith for six years. And now till present, 1963 till 2022, or current. <laughs> When the slide was made, it was 43 years, but it's 1963 to present. I mean, present could be, will be whatever, um, but from 1963 to 2022, it's the Universal House of Justice has been the supreme uh, universal body of the Baha'i community. And so in this slide, you can see the elected rulers and the appointed, the two branches, right? And you can see the Universal House of Justice, the National Spiritual Assemblies, the National Committees. And you can see the appointment of the National Spiritual Assembly from the regional Baha'i councils, as well as the local spiritual assemblies and local committees. And then the appointed arm, you can see the International Teaching Center, Continental Boards of Counselors, Auxiliary Boards for protect, Propagation and Protection, as and they also, and the Auxiliary Boards appoint their assistance to the members of the Auxiliary Board. And you can see on the right all the different Baha'i institutions, the 19-day fees, the archives, Auxiliary Boards, Counselors, the Courts, Covenant, the Baha'i Fast, the Baha'i Fund, the Guardianship, the Hands, Hazrat al-Quds, the learned is the institution of the learned, learning, the local assembly, marriage, the institution of Baha'i marriage, the Mashal Asghar, national assembly, pilgrimage, the publishing trust is an institution, the rulers are the other branch, right? The, the institution of scholars, the, the institution of the schools and the summer school and the Universal House of Justice. So you like... You should look up the compilations on these ones, the schools, the compilation on the summer school. The beloved, uh, the beloved guardian wrote so many different things on the future of schools, the future, and, and also the institution of summer schools, the roles of Baha'i summer schools. That these will be places of not only the flourishing of the soul, but the flourishing of the mind, places that will really foster the creation and development of these places and will eventually also become universities. So, and so this is just, a, it was a nice slide. You can, so you can see 1844 all the way to 1921. This is by Dwayne Troxel. If any of you wonderful souls know him. Doug, you have a hand, so happy. Go ahead. I was just, uh noticing making some notes uh about during the dispensation during the the ministry of the guardian in 1928 there were 102 local spiritual assemblies mm -hmm. two and i think they probably most of them didn't really know what they were in 1949 that number had grown to 595 in 1957 there were a few over 900 local spiritual assemblies. And then in 1963, there were 3,555. So between 1957 and 1963, it grew from 900 to three and a half thousand. Just interesting, interesting numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And so if that's the case, you know, in 1957 to 1963, you would think that now we have larger numbers in our communities, you would think it should be growing even faster, right? Because it's so hard for a small number, you know, group to grow to 
a sizable group. But if you have a larger group, it's much easier for a larger group to become even larger. But so what is holding us back? Why is, what is, you know, from, you know, going from, say, 400 assemblies to go to 6,000 assemblies, just giving, a, you know, an example, you know, um, what is, why, what is holding us back? And it's, you know, it's a very simple answer, dear friends. And we covered the main issues and problems in the advent, right? Materialism is one of them, right? We're the distractions of our world. And we have to, as Baha'is, stay focused. Our, spirit, our institutions, our local spiritual assemblies have to stay focused on teaching. Our communities have to stay focused on teaching. And so... It's not, we can't just always revert back to say, oh, it was so wonderful in 1960s and the 1970s, the faith was growing very nicely in America. And, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Baha'i community, yeah, I wasn't alive in the 1960s or 1970s, so I don't recall that. And the reality is, some of you know, you, dear friends, may have been around at those that point in time. Some of you may have declared during that point in time. But what are we doing now? What are we doing now to actively raise the capacities, teach? And you know, the, the current nine-year plan, the current plan is to go and raise the number. Uh, of these virgin communities, you know, to to chain, you know, go and target these virgin communities and bring them from um, to a higher degree milestone, you know, from being a milestone one to a milestone two. Or and so the reality is, what are we doing actively as individuals? Because that really is raising capacity. And and to your dear to your point, dear Doug, so very well point in the sense of there was such a, and also to dear testifier's point, these hands of the cause of God were pure gems and magnetic, magnetic, um, I would say pure magnets. I don't know how, you, you know, really where they went, the friends could not, but feel their energy, their warmth and excitement, their hearts connected to Baha'u'llah. And so from Mr. Samandari to Zikrullah Khadem to Mr. William Sears to you name it, these souls were such absolute gems. And I encourage you to read their lives to Miss Martha Root, you know, read their lives. I mean, they were no different than any one of us, except that they gave their whole being to Baha'u'llah. They gave their whole being to Baha'u'llah first. And every breath was their first. Would he be happy with? Would May I ask something? Asa? Please, dear Tesfai, go ahead. You know, what I observe is for us, for the new generation, when you go back to look all these histories, old structures, and all the Baha'is in the past, to bring us all these bounties and blessings for us, for the new generation, and how they sacrifice their life, their money, their time, and then even their life, everything, you know. So for us, when I compare myself, I'm really, I'm not a strong Baha'i like them because we need, we have all the tools today, mm. but our action is not that much. We are supposed to be, you know, in the rate of that, the speed of growing in the past right now is, I don't know, I, the way I see there are so many obstacles and so many things going on in the world. So it is not an easy to be Baha'i. And then uh, we have a big task to 
come over all these things and then to teach the faith of God, you mm. don't need to keep to ourselves whatever we know. So we need to share it. If you are not sharing it, that means we are not doing our job. Absolutely. It's very important. Great point, dear Tesfai. I know we went off, as they say, on a tangent, but it's, um, but it's a very imp uh, interesting discourse we're having now. We should not get down. The beloved guardian says we should not get down or get, you know, get um, dwell on the unpleasant things of life. You know, the, the, the oh God, refresh and gladden me. We should not dwell on the unpleasant things of life. And in, it's the reality is there are two processes at work. And we study these in Advent of Divine Justice, these twin processes, right? The process of integration and the process of disintegration, right? And in these twin processes are at work. The process of integration is the Baha'i community working on itself, working to develop itself. And if you recall, in our course on the advent of divine justice, there was a slide and I, I used the words of the beloved guardian to make this picture. The process of integration, the beloved guardian says, it's slow and steady, okay? And the, I use the visual image of the tortoise, <laughs> slow and steady. And the process of disintegration, is fast and furious. <laughs> so the breakdown is fast and furious. What? So if we're looking around and we see everything's getting worse, right? And then we get to look at the Baha'i community and we're looking like, oh, it's not really moving. Remember, slow and steady should be the onward march of the cause. That's the, how we should move, like the tortoise, the beloved guardians, slow and steady. But we should pick up pace, slow and steady, right? But the, the breakdown of the, the institutions, these um, ideologies, and is fast and furious. The world is daily getting worse. But the, this beautiful new blossoming flower will eventually, the whole world will see it. So this is the uh, mentioned uh, in uh, the, by the beloved guardian on that. So I just wanted you to share you that. Yes, at times we may feel that, you know, there's not much going on. But this, even this institute process that we're still at the very, per se, early stages of seeing the full scope of it. We could say, what is this thing? You know, I don't see much progress happening. I don't see it. I don't see what's happening. You know, I don't see the vision of the universal house of justice. Slow and steady. How many community members in your community are wholeheartedly embracing this process? Or is it just a few? And if it was the whole community, do you think the vision of the Universal House of Justice would, of this institute process will have taken on a complete new transformation when they say devotionals? If everyone embraced devotionals, the devotional spirit in your entire area would suddenly massively jump. People would be inviting their friends and suddenly now their friends are coming into it. And then they'd be like, oh, I want to have a home visit. And so now you go and visit their homes and suddenly now you have home visits. Oh, we have this other thing called a study circle. I would love to invite you over a study circle. So now you had devotionals, you have home visits and suddenly study circles start emerging. Oh, you have children? Oh, we have this other thing. I would love to invite you to a children's class. So now they, their children are coming in. You have a junior youth, junior youth classes emerge. You see, organic approach. If the whole community embraces the process of the universal house of justice and not just a few elements of it, because if a few elements embrace it, while the vast majority does not, what happens? It is not 
does not really work. This is why unity is so important. The Baha'i community, all the elements have to work and march together, just like an army. That's why it's called marching together in serried lines. We have to be working together, close-knit. Okay, so we've got a few more slides in this part. Um, so the, the, we were talking about the hands of the cause of God, right? So uh, in uh, 1921, the beloved guardian, um, uh, the passing of Abdu'l-Bahá, then the ministry of the beloved guardian commences, right? From 1921 to 1957. So this is the, then the beloved guardian appointed um, hands of the cause of God posthumously by the beloved guardian. So they were appointed 1928, 1952, 1925. So these are some incredible, incredible souls that the beloved guardian, this is in uh, per se a contingent, uh, the third uh, contingent, but posthumously appointed by the beloved guardian. You can see Haji Amin. He, this, he was the, um, the of the Hulula. He was an Amin. John Henry Hyde Dunn. And we talked about him in... Um, the advent of divine justice, the conqueror of Australasia, the conqueror of Australasia, John Henry Haitan. And he's mentioned not only in Advent, he's mentioned in the beloved guardian's only book that he wrote. So, and that's a pop quiz question. What was the only book that the beloved guardian wrote? God passed by. There you go. Good job, dear Tesfai. God passes by. And what year did he write it? I think in 1937. No. Uh, 19, 19, uh, I think 19. Uh, I see Farzad's lips. He gets the point. 1944. The oh, centenary yeah, yeah, 19, of the of the uh, declaration of the Bob. Centenary of the declaration of the Bob. So 1844, 1944. So it was the centenary of the declaration of the Bob. And so. You're right. You're right. So if you go read Priceless Pearl, okay, that section on, I encourage you uh, to read that section where um, the beloved guardian, and I'm not using these words loosely, he killed himself to during that two-year period to write The God Passes By. I mean, for one year, he read everything that, that had been written on the faith. And the uh, Avatul Bahari Khanim, God bless her so for writing Priceless Pearl and writing the beloved guard, the, the book Beloved Guardian. I mean, we because we get to, we get to feel the you know we get to feel the suffering, the humor, the gentility of the guardian. We get to feel and we see his absolute humility, his love for the faith as and his obedience and sacrifice in, in the Priceless Pearl. And one of the things that I, I always love in reading Priceless Pearl is his brilliance, his diligence. And one of the things he did that was so cool because he had to know... He, you know, he had to know about what's going on in the world all the time, right? So he would always have five or six newspapers. He would be reading all the time. Le Monde, the, the great French newspaper, the, the, the newspaper of Jerusalem, he would be reading. And so he would always, and he would get, to, uh, and he would read them. And he would, and he would get, Amitil Bahari Khanum, he would point to this area and, you know, say, I want that clipping, you know? And so... Abdul Baha Rihanum would clip these, you know, zip, 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 and key and then he, uh, all these newspaper clippings, because they were mentioned something significant, right? And they would all be stuffed into Abdul Baha Rihanum's purse. All the important um events or stories of that day. So as he was writing these letters to the world, for example, is he writing to India or to Burma or to um, England or to uh, United States, and he was if he was going to mention an event or an, he would have all of these at his disposal. And this is the brilliance of the mind of the beloved guardian, always having 
I mean, it will be very interesting. I was thinking about it, you know, in the future Baha'i world, you know, in say a thousand, at least a thousand years, remember, at least a thousand years, how the, the new next manifestation of God will reveal. I mean, because we already live in an information age, right? You know, and so we, we His Holiness Baha'u'llah revealed a hundred volumes by pen. I would be interesting to see how that happens, you know, because, you know, a hundred volumes is, oh, well, he, you know, less than a, less than a, uh, a memory stick. <laughs> so how will that happen in the future Baha'i world? It will be very interesting to see how revelation will happen. But anyway, that was a tangent. So these are the other um, um, incredible hands of the cause of God that passed away um, before um, they were appointed posthumously as hands of the cause of God. John Ebenezer Esselmont. This one, oh, I wanted to name my my child Esselmont, my son Esselmont, but my wife vetoed that because it's an interest. Yeah. So I, and then I wanted to name my him Breakwell. Okay. And my wife vetoed that one too. So I got to, I got to, I got him to be called William and after William Sutherland Maxwell and, uh, and also, um, so, and William Sears, but, but truly Esselmont is, was the name that I really loved, but my wife said, Esson, no, no. First of all, it's a difficult spelling and how many Esselmonts do you really know? But Esselmont, what? He was the best friend of the beloved guardian. Go read. What a treasure he was. I mean, the beloved guardian truly found rest with Esselmont. I mean, a new era. Yes. Yes. Baha'u'llah Baha in the new era. Baha That's the, the one that makes me Baha'i. The book that I read. It is. It is um, Marzia Gale. Uh, Marzia Gale said, this is the manuscript for all teaching, Baha'u'llah in the New Era. The National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is in the United States, all throughout the 1960s and the 1970s, during this period of intensive teaching in the United States. So if you're like, how did, how was teaching so happening in the United States? Is because, I'll tell you, but the National Spiritual Assembly mandated that all the spiritual assemblies have deepening programs on Baha'u'llah New Era. There was actual deepening programs on Baha'u'llah New Era and how to present Baha'u'llah New Era. So I encourage you, if you've been a Baha'i all your life, have you read Baha'u'llah New Era? Three and a half chapters of it are is revealed word by Abdul Baha. So it's not, oh, it's just, a you know, Esselmont's words. Three and a half chapters is, is sacred word from Abdul Baha. So um, Esselmont, what is so? I encourage you, you need, to read you his need life. You have a, a lot of seeds to, to name your, your baby. To be I know. You got to have so many babies because there's so many awesome souls, right, dear Tesla? <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. Right, and then we go to then we go to Lewis Gregory. What an incredible so awesome! So Lewis Gregory, I um, Lewis Gregory, an incredible uh, book was also written on Lewis Gregory. Um, it's unique. Yes, Lewis Gregory, an incredible was written by the um, the counselor. Um, what is her name? It's escaping me. Um, if anyone knows it off the top of their head, they get extra credit on this one. Uh, Lewis Gregory? It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a book. He's a good friend of uh, Baha Abdul Baha. Yes. So Lewis Gregory married Louisa Matthews. Yeah, and the first. Uh, they were the first. Marriage. The first uh, inter. Uh, racial, marriage. racial marriage, Lewis yes. Gregg. And when I was reading Baha'i News, you know, uh, that was one thing I did for Advent of Divine Justice was read all the Baha'i News. And 
when Louis Gregory came after his pilgrimage to the United States, he was a transformed soul. I mean, absolute on fire. And the beloved guardian, um, when uh, in that period of time, the beloved guardian advised him to be in the, uh, as he, because the, his mission per se was to go from the north all the way through the south, right? And this was a period where um, the United States was still embroiled in um, racial tensions. So this is not a period where um, there were still lynchings. There were still... Um, Tough time. There, there were still um, extreme racial discrimination throughout the South, okay? And so... Um, so the beloved guardian um, advised Lewis Gregory to go with a white um, Baha'i to go through the South and on his teaching. Um, and it's in Baha'i News. And I encourage you, and I was, when I find, uh, I'll find it and send it to the class. And it's so incredible, uh, the instances of Lewis Gregory when he would go into areas that were super discriminatory, uh, discriminatory right? Um, when, I, when I say that these souls were so magnetic, it's an understatement. There was one instance when Lewis Gregory entered into, um, it was almost like a KKK um, community college, okay? It was literally like that. And God bless him, Louis Gregory, this incredible soul, walked into there and everyone and me immediately on first seeing him started getting angry and upset at him. Then Louis Gregory started to talk. And they all were falling into his, uh, per se, hypnotic uh, waves of love that were pouring forth from his lips. And the they kept trying to see the reaction of his white, um, per se, they thought master, you know, because he they thought he was his slave that he was walking, going around with. But it was actually the reverse <laughs> on the spiritual level, you know, that... <laughs> Lewis Gregory was truly the master in this example. And it was of such beauty that the entire audience was so captivated and uh, spellbound by Lewis Gregory that when he left, they had no, they had completely forgotten who or what they were upset with and were left with this feeling of joy and happiness. And um, a letter came to the white uh, accompanier that he should go back and visit that audience. And several of those audience members became Baha'i. But it was just the transformation of the heart. Wherever they walked, they transformed it. So that was just an instance. I, I'll share that. Uh, uh, it's, it's in Baha'i news. So Agha Muhammad Tariya Isfahani was another Keith Ransom Keller. This is an incredible lady that she went uh, to Iran at the request of, and she worked in that um, Tarbiat school. Um, Martha Root. I, hey, so go, John, please, please. Pardon me. Martha Root was not posthumously was known she? as the hand of the cause, hand of the cause, I don't think. Oh, let me let me double check yeah, on it. You're right. Mar Martha Ruth is not the hand of the cause, yeah. No, she is, but I didn't know if she was posthumous. Yeah, I don't think so. She's not the hand of the cause, but she is a good... No, she is a hand of the cause of God. She's actually has the highest rank of hand of the cause. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I read her book about her. I doubt if she was posthumously. Okay. She was, she was. If you look her up on, not only on Baha'i 
Wikipedia, on Wikipedia, on everything, mm. because she was she passed away in 1939. Okay. Mm. And, and she was uh, designated as a hand of the cause posthumously. Yes, okay. she was. Mm. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank no, you. No, no, you're good. You're good. Absolutely. Good questions. Absolute good points. And Sayyid Mustafa Rumi. This guy's got a shrine in, 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 in I think it's in, it's in Burma. And go look this guy up. Read, read on this guy. He opened entire, the, the country of India. And incredible, incredible soul is Sayyid Mustafa Rumi. Is this the poet? Uh, Rumi, is he the poet? The poet, totally different guy. <laughs> I asked the same question from my husband. Now. Yeah, the, the, the poet Rumi, the famous uh, Rumi, actually lived in the 11th century, some yeah. 800, 800 years before that. Way earlier, exactly. Yeah. Hey, at least 800 or so years before that. Yeah. Not that, not that this Rumi probably did not. He probably had some good poetry, but totally different guy. Yeah, they are different. Yeah. Okay, but there's a wonderful book on Sayyid Mustafa Rumi, and um, he's in, he was an incredible, indefatigable teacher of the cause of God, and he right. and his incredible um, teaching throughout India, Burma. And the, that those areas, entire villages entered the faith there, and it's um, um, and many um, uh, of those um, relations are descendants are Baha'is today in those areas, uh, and there's a, and a wonderful uh, um, per se shrine to um, Sayyid Mustafa Rumi in, in existence. Um, um, Abdul Jalil Sa'ad, Sa'ad um, I don't know much about this um, one, um, and Roy Wilhelm, um, the, Roy Wilhelm was, uh, as he was also the chairman of the National Spiritual Assembly uh, and in the United States, and so he also, um, incredible servants. So then there is also the first contingent of Hands of the Cause of God, Dorothy Beecher Baker, Amelia Collins. And these, so these, uh, some of these friends we've talked about in our class in Advent of Divine Justice, Ali Akbar Frutan. This is, this is one of the Hands of the Cause I, I, I actually met. What an incredible soul. Uh, he, he lived to, yeah, a I mean, nice, too. long life. Um, yeah. Hugo Ghiacheri, the Italian, what an incredible, uh, the uh, services that he did for the beloved guardian, getting yeah. the marble for the, the all, the, I mean, pretty much the whole world center is marble. <laughs> so he, he to, to orchestrate, to get the, the marble from Italy was really Hugo Ghiacheri, Herman Grossman, and then Horace Hawley, the secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly. Um, and so many incredible things Horace Holly did. I encourage you to read the lies. And what a cool middle name, Hotchkiss. <laughs> I've never heard of Hotchkiss before. And then Le Leroy Ayas. Uh, what did it, uh, um, he was the treasurer, I believe. Uh, and he, um, in, he did uh, incredible services also. Um, and uh, the... I know uh, Boshpa High School, um, a lot of it's the cabin areas were burnt down, but there's this a small uh, area in the woods uh, that has been dedicated to Leroy Ayas because he visited Boshpa High School and it's called the Ayas Grove. And it's this grove of these incredible uh, redwood trees that shh, they just go into the stratosphere, uh, these trees. And then there's this kind of clearing and this clearing in this area is because there was an, a mother redwood tree. And this tree was must have been uh, so huge. And all these really huge redwoods all around it are where it's babies, <laughs> you know, and now they're so huge all around it. So you see what I'm saying? 
So this, there was a huge, and this Ios Grove area in Boshpa High School is in honor of uh, Leroy, Leroy Ayas, Hand of the Cause of God. And Williams. if I'm not mistaken, please, please. Mm -hmm. wasn't Leroy Ayas one of the ones of the, of the ones in Haifa after the Guardian's passing? Yes, he was one of the Ministry of the Custodians, I believe. Right, yeah. Right, right. And William Sutherland Maxwell. So this is the father of Rio Hanum. So, and in our study of in Advent of Divine Justice, you, uh, I had a, uh, a, a few slides to show um, that he designed the legislative building um, in, um, was it Montreal? It was, I think it was, uh, it, it, I think it's the legislative building in, I think it's Montreal. I'm probably going to get some email from some friend that says, no, Esan, it was this city. But it was, uh, but he, uh, William Sutherland Maxwell designed this le incredible legislative building. And I encourage you to go on Google image search, William Sutherland Maxwell, and you can see this incredible building. And why I'm mentioning it is because if you look at the very front of the building, very front of it, you're staring straight at it, you'll see that it's, it looks just like the archives building, okay? And who was the designer? <laughs> William Sutherland Maxwell, right? And then if you look at the, the, the top of the legislative building that he designed, you'll see that it looks very similar to the Shrine of the Bob. So it's very interesting that this same architect that the beloved guardian chose for the superstructure for the Shrine of the Bob used the elements for his award, from his award-winning legislative building. And these elements um, that the beloved guardian is said, it's, it blends harmoniously the East and the West. And so this is something... And the that uh, William Sutherland Maxwell so beautifully did in his design for the Shrine of the Bob, and so that's something uh, to his credit. Um, Historic, exactly. Then Mr. Samandari, Taraz Tarazolot Samandari. This is uh, one of the hands of the cause of God that was a the only one that really was alive during the ministry of Baha'u'llah all the way to and passed away and lived all the way to 1968. So right after, per se, the end of the uh, World Crusades. So he lived a very nice, healthy, long life. And if you recall, he was always the one that had his hand on his heart. What, an, what a gem, Mr. Samandari. George Townsend, the great Irish, the luminary from Ireland, right? George Townsend. He wrote that incredible book, um, Christ and Baha'u'llah, and um, encourage you guys to read George Townsend. He also was the one that the beloved guardian turned to uh, when he wanted his books named. So, so he, uh, he turned to his dear friend, George Townsend. He says, I've written this long book, and I need a name for it. And George Townsend said, how about God Passes By? And that's how he got the name, God Passes By, George Townsend. And also, another factoid on George Townsend, you all probably have heard, oh, oh, Lord, make me a hollow reed from which the pith of self hath been blown, right? That's a prayer from George Townsend. And you can find that in his book, uh, The Mission of Baha'u'llah. Okay. Factoids, right? Good things. Okay. And dear friends, we're at 832. And you always need my dear Zamrui John to keep me on top of these things. So, so anyway, we're at 832. So we're going to stop there for tonight. We're almost finished up that full section. So um hope you are enjoying this per se study um synoptic study of 
it's going to get so much cooler as we really start getting into the administrative order, the, the uniqueness of this administrative order, and also how it's tied to, per se, what's being unveiled by our supreme body currently. So it's we're, we're starting all the way from Kitab Ahtas, you know, building up with the will and testament of Abdul Baha, and now we're showing the the link of the beloved guardian to the ministry of the custodians. We're going to show it, and we're going to have a whole section on the universe house of justice, the beloved guardian, and then it's going to be really cool. I can't wait to show all these things to you. But, dear friends, it's if anyone has any question, we have one time for one question, and then we're going to have our closing prayer. Can I do that? Okay, go ahead, dear Tesfai. Yeah, it might be a little longer question, so because uh, how many of these hand of the codes are died and buried in the Holy Land, and most of them, as as much as I know, they not buried and died in their own country, but all of them are to be, I think, out of their own. Uh, country. So do you have that data for next time maybe or something like that? Uh, I can look it up. It's not a, not that hard. There's um, at least I think at least two or three are in the um, the resting place of um, I the... think Laura Gessner is to be in Cairo and then there are uh, some of them are also over there in different yeah, places. Yeah, they're all the over. Their 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 resting Argentina, places are all over the world. Yeah, they're 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 so, because they traveled, they taught, and you know, and that's yeah. they're all over the place. And but there's that, a few. That there's a few be, in the world center. Yeah, is that to be there is a mystery of behind that where they are going to be buried and going around the world? Might be some impact on that because I just want to know because of the teaching, they're spreading the faith and then they go over there and they, they didn't come back. No, it's just their love and obedience and sacrifice. I mean, remember this body that we have is just a, a tool. It's a vehicle for yeah. the soul, you know? And yeah. it really is. It's where it eventually ends up doesn't really matter. You know, it really doesn't matter because in the end, we all have this soul that has been gifted by Baha'u'llah to us. And this soul is eternal. And I mean, this is the most beautiful. And I encourage you again to read Gleanings from the Writings of Baha'u'llah. Gleanings from the Writings of Baha'u'llah where it talks about this soul. And every time you read the words of Baha'u'llah, it uplifts you because how magnificent the words of Baha'u'llah that, that any, other, any other faith is so limited in scope compared to talking about the hereafter, what is to come, what is, you know, and the incredible words of Baha'u'llah talking about the soul, what is, you know, and the analogies of that, you know, this world is, as in, you know, just like the womb and of, of, of a mother and in the world of the matrix and that the world to come are just boundless, infinite in scope. I, it's just a mix. I mean, really makes you want to do, you know, I'm not saying I want to do that. I'm just saying it, it makes you just so excited for what's to come. It really does. It really makes you um, that's why, you know, the, the, the hidden word, death is a messenger of joy. Yeah. Because often when we're get, reaching that point, we're not in great health. We're often in physical pain and suffering. And, and sometimes, God forbid, we're becoming a burden on our families and everything like that. And we never want that to happen. So that. This world becomes a prison to us. Our bodies literally become a prison. But death is really? literally, literally lifting. Now our soul has the wings and can traverse the worlds of God. It's so awesome. I mean, Baha'u'llah's imagery and um, that 
you know, it's uh, I encourage you again, read uh, the, the extracts of gleanings because it gives you so much excitement. Yeah, you're right. Uh, what is to come? What is to come? Um, and then our body is, doesn't travel more than one hour after you passed away. That's what it says. So it's but one hour, okay, from the, 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 the city boundaries, okay? So that is for bur the, the, the law on burial, okay? It's one hour from the, the city boundaries or, or township boundaries or whatever. From the place where you passed away. So that's exactly. exactly. That's why the house of, the hand of the cause is to be buried everywhere because they can't come back home. Sure, sure, exactly. It's also these, we could talk about these things in a future class, but it's it's about so that people don't fly bodies around the world. And <laughs> <laughs> But it's all out of respect. Remember, remember, this is out of love and respect for this, the body, which is, which was the vehicle for the soul. That's why in, in the Baha'u'llah said that he is for bad, um burning of the body what is it called um cremation cremation exactly cremation he, his holiness baha'u'llah has forbade cremation and out and has uh this um incredible uh per se this is the only really ceremony in the faith that we have the wrapping of the body in, in and this uh the, the recital of the uh prayer for the departed is, this is a type of the only real rites, or in a sense, ritual as a Baha'is that we have is this the respect for the sacredness of the temple, because this is the temple, the physical temple that we have. Um, and so it's um, these are things that um, the more that you understand on the um, these things, you'll un, you'll learn the wisdom of. Baha'u'llah in revealing these uh, laws. Anyway, I didn't want to talk too much on these things, but yeah. but th that was to your question, dear Testifier. Thank um, you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I told you that it's a little bit in. Zamru Hijan has a hand. Zamru Hijan has a hand. When you're ready, I'm ready with a closing prayer. I love it, Zamru Hijan. There you go. <laughs> So yeah. let's let's close this one down and wishing you all a wonderful night and a great week. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. O thou beloved of my heart and soul, I have no refuge save thee. I raise no voice at dawn save in thy commemoration and praise. Thy love encompasseth me and thy grace is perfect. My hope is in thee, O God. Give me a new life at every instant and bestow upon me the breaths of the Holy Spirit at every moment in order that I may remain steadfast in thy love. Attain unto great felicity, perceive the manifest light and be in the state of utmost tranquility and submissiveness. Verily thou art the giver, the forgiver, the compassionate, Abdul Baha. Good night, everyone. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Sandra. Bye. 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 Bye